Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvain Lézé from the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College, and this is a new episode of uh, Turbulence at the Exascale podcast. Uh, for those not familiar with the podcast, uh, the aim of it is to gather the view of the community uh, regarding exascale computing for turbulence research and what are the challenges and opportunity associated with uh, exascale computing for uh, the turbulence community. So this podcast is part of the Excalibur initiative that was launched in the UK last year. It's led by the Met Office, the UK Atomic uh, Energy Authority and the UK Research Innovation. And its aim is to deliver research and innovative algorithm development uh, to harness the power of exascale computing. And um, this is also a joint effort with the UK uh, Turbulence uh, Consortium. And uh, the podcast will really uh, allow us uh, to discuss uh, what we need to do and where we are at regarding the transition to exascale computing. So today our guest is uh, Alistair Revel, who is a reader at the University of Manchester in the Department of Mechanics, Aerospace and Civil Engineering, and his research interests span from um, hybrid rounds, LES method, synthetic turbulence, uh, fluid structure interaction, um, interactive real-time computer simulation, uh, biofluid mechanics, and so on and so on. So we'll have the opportunity to uh, discuss all this with Alistair. So good morning, Alistair. Morning, Sylvan. Thanks for having uh, me. It's, it's a great pleasure to have a chat with you. And um, for those who are not, um, who don't know you, who, uh, who don't know you very well, um, can you tell us more about yourself, where you're from, what you have studied and how did you end up uh, at the University of Manchester? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm originally from, not too far away from, from where you're based, um, South Bucks, northwest of London, end of the Metropolitan Line. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, I, I chose Manchester out of a number of places based on the fact that it was another big city, but it was also a comfortable distance away from home. Um, um, you know, I like the big city feel, but didn't necessarily want to stay uh, on my doorstep. And I think, um, yeah, the other, the other big reason for choosing Manchester, which, where, which is where I went to study aerospace engineering with French, um, was because they were one of the only places that offered the joint honours with, um, with, with French. And as a, as a, um, as a child, I, I spent time, quite a lot of time in Canada, where I was kind of taught French from a young age. And French was basically a, a big part of my, you know, um, learning all the way through school. I did it for A-level and I spent, I did um, uh, placements in Marseille as a, as, as a school kid. And then um, I, I, I was basically looking to, to carry that on through my studies in, in engineering. And so I chose Manchester partly for that reason. In, in, um, during my studies in Manchester, I, I spent some time in Poitiers. I think that's, you were maybe based there even at the same time in, in Ansma. Yes. I did um, a few months uh, in the LRT Labor Laboratoire d'Etudes Thermiques and um, um, looking at tunnel fire uh, ventilation. And that was really my first kind of experience with CFD. And um, I, I mean, I really enjoyed the CFD, but I really also enjoyed being in France. And I think coming back, looking at the job op options that were available at the time, I was keen to carry on doing a PhD, but also really keen to go back to France. So uh, the main condition for me doing a PhD was to go back to France. I, I found Dominique Laurence um, and um, he offered the uh, opportunity to do a PhD um, partly with um, IMFT in Toulouse, mm -hmm. spent a year there with Mariana Brasa, looking at um, various aspects of tournaments modeling and, um, and, and a half a year in, in Paris in the ODF team, the, um, the development team of uh, Code Saturn. So that was kind of a, a constant theme. And I think the, as, you know, as luck had it, I, I was kind of thrown into an environment where, you know, it was a really turbulence modeling was all around me. I think my first week of my PhD, there was a workshop in Manchester where, um, you know, Brian was speaking, Brian Launder was speaking, uh, Florian Mentor was speaking, Joel Fertiger was speaking, and this was like, you know, my first few days. So I, you know, I, I was a bit spoiled really for, for <laughs> kind of uh, the, the, the people that were there to, to inspire me. And yeah, it just went from there really. I, um, I, I've, I've stayed in Manchester, obviously. I was kind of, I was fortunate enough to get offered a lecture pretty well, almost straight after my PhD 
it's kind of a blessing in disguise because uh, a mixed blessing because um it was very heavily teaching focused but also i probably wouldn't have stayed on if, if there hadn't been that kind of an opportunity so um it was it was good from that point of view and also um i've spent Although I've been based in Manchester, I've spent quite a lot of time abroad since then. I've had some time in um, in Stanford, CTR, Centre for Turbulence Research, um, in, in Madrid, working with um, um, fluid structure interaction and immersed boundary methods in, in CMAT with, um, with Alfredo Pinelli, who's now in, in City. And um, actually, recently, last year, I was in uh, Melbourne um, with uh, Richard Sandberg and Fortunately, with the events that happened, I had to come back a bit early, but, you know, um, still, it was interesting to get started. So, um, so yeah, and I've, um, my interest, to, you know, I've, I've, my base has always been in turbulence modelling, but my interest has broadened a bit over the time, as you, as you mentioned. So, started to look at fluid structure interaction, um, uh, look at playing a bit with uh, Lattice Boltzmann uh, GPUs, looking at different ways, different use modes for CFD. Um, I'm... Yeah, just following my interests is one of the things I love about academia. Uh, I was about to ask you that that's my uh, follow up question on this. Uh, I mean, you have been in Manchester for quite some time now as a lecturer and as a reader. And I want I wanted to ask you what's the best thing about your uh, your uh, academic position here in Manchester? Yeah, so I guess it's the it's the flexibility of, I mean, first and foremost in academia, it's the flexibility, right? It's the freedom to, you know, if you're doing, um, if, if you're, if you're doing something interesting and, 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 um, uh, and doing it well enough, then you're basically free to, to follow, to pursue the interests where, wherever they are. And I, I think I was always a bit, um, unsure where, where I wanted to go in, in, in my career, you know, whether it be in one industry or another. And I think, what really sold academia for me was the chance to to spend a bit of time almost in, in several sectors. Um, I've, I mean, I had a um, uh, originally a lot of my work was in the aerospace domain. Another kind of kind of twist of fortune was that throughout my PhD, I was heavily involved in EU projects in the aerospace community. Um, that was, you know, via the, the the kind of links of Dominique and Tim Craft, who was one of my supervisors as well. I was working, you know, working the Flowmania project, which was looking at second moment closures, rental stress models, the CIDA project looking at detached data simulation, and then um, the attack project, which was looking, you know, for, again at hybrid RANS LES and um, go for hybrid again, uh, you know, a fourth project in that theme. So in some ways I felt like I had a, not just two supervisors, but, you know, 20 from all of these different um, organizations around Europe and you know, we'd be going there, you know how some of these EU projects are, they're, they're quite rigorous in their re reporting requirements. But yeah. the flip side was that, you know, I got to see, attend a lot of meetings, uh, learn a lot from, from, from those around me. So that was a plus. I think in Manchester specifically, it's always had this kind of um, strong industrial link, right? It's always been a, a place where um, it tries to translate things you know, from theory into into reality. I think, I mean, I think it was the place where there was the first uh, engineering professor in the UK. So I think Osborne Reynolds um, in Manchester, turn of the last century, had that kind of title or was known for that. And um, it was obviously at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. And I think from that onwards, it was known as a place where, you know, you could go to translate theory into in, into real things. And that's very much been the theme of my my research career where I've I've looked to be at the interface of industry and you know some of the um, you know some of the more recent developments in, in modeling and simulation you know trying to translate and, and mold them for their specific needs the other thing I really like about Manchester is its kind of social side the social responsibility is one of the the, the three kind of core goals of, of Manchester most universities have it, but it's really prominent in univer in Manchester. You know, it's it's all about engaging with the public, trying to um, find because it like like Imperial, right? We're right in the heart of the the centre mm -hmm. of the city. You know, and it's you kind of there's so much going on in, in and around you. It's very hard not to be a social university, right? You know, it's just it's just all around. So I really like the diversity and the the opportunity to. Um, 
to, to not just interact with people from all academics and, and scientists from all around the world, but, you know, from, from people all around you um, in all walks of life. And I think that's what I really like about it, the city feel. Great. Thank you. Uh, can you give us like one or two examples of, of um, turbulent flows or uh, fluid flow that you are currently investigating just to see what you are doing? I don't know if you have a lot of time to do some research these days, but if you can give us one or two examples to see ex what you are doing currently, that would be very interesting. Yeah, there's never enough time. <coughs> right? um, um, it's always the always wish there'd be more, but I mean, the in, in the area of turbulence, um, the the main kind of things that we're looking at are um, again looking at trying to de to de de develop practical pragmatic solutions um, that that offer improved accuracy at, at some kind of a compromise of cost. So looking at zonal methods is a big part of my work. I think you mentioned at the beginning synthetic turbulence. So the ability to move from a RANS region to an LES region um, efficiently allowing you to use basically a, a good quality LES, not, not compromising too much, but at the same time, you know, retaining some of the, all the advantages and strengths of a, of a good RANS. Emphasizing, you know, RANS um, is it encapsulates so many different models that, 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 that you still have to be aware of, of what is the right RANS for a given, for a given flow. So some of the things I'm working on at the moment, um, we're doing some work with, um, F1 uh, industry looking at um, having zonal simulation approaches. So, you know, the vast majority of, of work in F1 is, is RANS based, um, but um, they're increasingly looking at introducing uh, simulation, uh, so hybrid methods. So, for instance, the flow past the front wing is generally well captured um, with a RANS approach, but the ensuing kind of vortex pattern and interaction with the, the front wheel is is more complicated so we're, we're looking at developing approaches that have uh, an embedded simulation region behind the front wing and around the mm -hmm. wheel something that we've 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 been working on um another one in a similar vein is looking at um urban geometries so increasingly there's there's a focus on understanding the flow uh, in urban environments and Actually, that's an industry where the use of hybrid RANs and simulation has really taken off in recent years because they've 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 they recognised the need for unsteady flow information. You know, looking at you know, in their world, looking at uh, pedestrian level wind or pedestrian comfort. You you in order to to measure that, you need fluctuating wind information. So mm -hmm. it's um, you know it's very important to be able to 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 use the right methods. So while a lot of um like uh the, the the work in that area is using kind of standard approaches they're potentially missing some of the detail by not you know not using some of the the the, the better zonal methods to that allow you to go very efficiently and quickly from a from a rans region to an les region um so i mean i guess i should say in contrast to you know a very basic kind of overview of hybrid RANS LES. Um, there's 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 the kind which is a seamless method or a global method like the tax study Sorry, simulation. I'm having trouble hearing you. My my Siri inter intervening. <laughs> um, and there, so you don't necessarily need to decide where it's RANS or LES. And then the the others are what you know a zonal uh, approach where you decide in advance where you want mm -hmm. to be RANS or where you want to be LES. And both have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so I, I'm involved in both uh, to some degree. In the, as an example of something that we're working on recently um, in, in a different area, we're looking at some nature inspired flows. In the past, I've looked at um, the flow around wings with tubercles, leading edge mm -hmm. tubercles uh, for, for enhanced aerodynamic performance. We're now looking at some flows around penguins. So mm -hmm. in, this, in the zoology department in, in Manchester, they've got very high resolution images of, 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 of penguins in different, different um, positions and, and, and poses and in glide. And we're, we're doing some turbulent simulations around, around that to, to try to understand better um, you know, the reasons for their pose that, that they seem to adopt at certain, at certain conditions and, um, and how that kind of varies with different flow conditions. Yeah, fascinating. And um, what type of, um, or oh, uh, which flow solvers you are using to do your um, your simulations? Well, I, I know you are using uh, open foam and, and concession, but maybe you can tell us a bit more 
about uh, yeah 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 sure yeah, the solvers i mean the okay uh, the like i said the at the beginning the the code that i kind of grew up with and my phd was code saturn and um you know, as, as you would have picked up on a bit, bit of a francophile, you know, uh, it was very, it was quite fun learning a, uh, abbreviated um, Fortran code in, in French. Um, but that uh, gave me, um, you know, a good grounding in industrial finite volume methods. Um, and later on, Open Foam, I, we picked that up and used it um, because it's very similar to, to code Saturn in many ways. And um, it's probably fair to say that it's, it's more widely used. Um, it has a, a range of, uh, you know, probably a broader range of different physics modules. But in, at the same time, we've, we've kept, our, kept an activity going with code Saturn because of its, you know, what we think, and I guess quite a lot of people think um, is it's um, probably superior uh, suitability for HPC uh, and exascale in, in the future. So um, we, we have an ongoing activity with, um, with um, EDF where uh, they're obviously they're the originators of Code Saturn, um, where, where they're very keen for us to kind of continue to develop our, you know, recent turbulence uh, simulation hybrid RANS LES approaches and, 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 and test them in, in, in their codes. So aside, aside from Open Foam and Code Saturn, which, which is what we use for most of our work, particularly in turbulence. Uh, as I mentioned also at the beginning, we're, we're increasingly using and investigating Lattice Boltzmann solvers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, Lattice Boltzmann is another way to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, it's, you know, now it used to be debated whether it was equivalent, but now it's not, you know, it's, it's entirely equivalent um, in terms of the potential um, to, to achieve the the same answers and you know to solve the same physics but its um, formulation is very different and its suitability for in particular parallelization and, and in particular gpu computing i mean it's just in some cases phenomenal it's um it's it's extremely uh, uh parallelizable and scalable so that got me interested um uh, about about uh, seven or eight years ago I started looking into it and I, I was taken by not only how kind of um, amenable it was to things like um, immersed boundary and FSI which was my original motivation for looking at it but it's but it's um, it's it, it's speed on, on GPU so we've we've the, spent quite a lot of effort in the last few years you know I think the best way to learn a method is to develop a code uh, mm -hmm. so we've spent a um, uh, and we've, and we've developed a few codes in that lattice Boltzmann, you know, not all, the first one wasn't particularly good. So we started again and, you know, and, and gone, gone through it like that. And our, our latest one um, is focused on GPU and um, it uses a, a kind of a more recent formulation of LBM where it really minimizes the memory overheads. And um, the, the kind of performance you can get is really, really quite impressive. Um, and I think it has a place in, in, in exascale as a, as, 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 a, as, a, as a component of a future solution. One of the things we'll probably move on to talk about is a general theme of my research, like I've said before, is, is trying to find a pragmatic solution, you know, saying, okay, this is good in this context, that's good in that context. Don't try and force fit this method for everything. Try to use these two methods and, and, and together in a, in, in a pragmatic way. So. We've been working more recently on a on a dual approach, which combines a, a CFD a finite finite volume method like Code Saturn or Open Foam, with a, with an LBM approach. And the LBM approach can be running on GPU very efficiently, mm -hmm. and and the finite volume method can be running um, on CPU. And the, you know this kind of a heterogeneous architecture approach, um, you know, fits quite nicely with some of the some of the systems that are that, that are emerging. Wow. Okay, that's very that's very fascinating. So yeah, I mean, uh, th th you partly answer my my next question. I was about to ask you, what do you think is is the best strategy to 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 uh, run simulation, turbulent simulation on on um, on exascale computer or pre exascale computer? But it seems yeah. that uh, a mix between lattice Boltzmann and more conventional CFD solver might might be your uh, your, your uh, answer to that. Yeah, I think so. I think 
you know, too often there's, there's uh, like I said, a, a tendency to force fit things. You know, a good example in, in brands is, is the pragmatic solution of the, SS, the K Omega SST model, where it's effectively a blend between an Omega based model and an Epsilon based model. And it's um, not trying to, to, to extend the capabilities of one or the other, it's using the best of both worlds. Um, and that's the philosoph philosophy behind hybrid RANS LES as well. And that would be the philosophy behind the dual approach. You know, increasingly, uh, you look at the HPC architectures around us, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a mishmash of, um, of, of, of hardware. And, um, and also, if you look at the cloud, again, where you just have a, a huge range of different um, uh, of hardware available, it kind of makes sense to look and, and not limit yourself to one method. I think, I think a very important part of exascale computation is going to be it's going to be coupling you know now we, we've for a long time have been developing and refining and um, um enhancing basically single physics codes you know and if we're really serious about having um system level simulation you know an entire nuclear reactor an entire car an entire air, aircraft or whatever it is a human body you you're going to need to be able to interface codes mm -hmm. that handle different scales so multi-scale but also different physics in an efficient way um so that's the motivation behind exploring the kind of finite volume hooked up to lattice boltzmann it's one example i mean there's there's many examples that, that are increasingly used um in the literature and by other groups of of multi-scale that are more extreme um num orders of magnitude Right. Uh, sorry, I have a quick question. I forgot to ask you. Do you are you aware of any um, efforts to port uh, either OpenFOAM or Code Saturn on, on uh, GPUs? Or yeah, I mean, there have been uh, of, over the course of the last ten years. With I mean, the, the rise of GPU probably stretches more like fifteen to twenty years. But over the course of the last ten years, GPU as a as a a viable HPC solution for engineering simulation is, is clearly grown and grown. And you know, of course, there have been a lot of attempts to to port all or part of a, a finite volume code to to, to GPU. I, I think we started to look into it at one point, and you you know, in most cases, you would look at one part of the code. So it might be the the inversion, the, the matrix inversion part, or something which you can isolate and say, okay, this mm -hmm. is a really computation intensive part of the out of the whole solution algorithm and it's probably something that we can simplify and and get improvement gains on on, on gpu gpu but it's quite bitty you know um the, the advantage of cpu is its ability to kind of um to to deal with quite complex operations uh that and complex memory management um uh, across a whole range of different parts of an algorithm, you know, uh, of, of a software like OpenFOAM and Code Saturn. I don't really expect that you're ever going to get a, a very a hugely efficient version of a, of a finite volume code that was originally written in for a CPU ported to a GPU. I, I think you have to start from, from the ground up. And similarly with, with Lattice Boltzmann, we, we originally started looking at embedded refinement. So you might not know, everyone might not know that a, a kind of a vanilla Lattice Boltzmann implementation uses a uniform grid. Mm -hmm. um, which is a huge limitation if that's all you're going to use for your industrial solvers. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of work at, at, at developing lattice bots and to be able to be used in unstructured grids or, or stretch cells. But as soon as you do that, unsurprisingly, you lose your performance on, on GPU. And it's not, this isn't a limit, an observation limited to lattice bots, but it, you know, it's mm -hmm. equally relevant to a finite difference code. You know, a, you know an optimized finite difference code is, is going to be very, very efficient for, for a given uh, type of mesh as soon as you try and stretch it too far towards a, a very complex geometry case you're going to lose some of those advantages so again having the the capability of using a, a finite volume code on the cpu architecture which is where it's really efficient um and uh, a localized uh, simulation um uh for, on a solver which is really uh, fast for on a simple grid kind of makes sense absolutely Great. Um, I have a question about uh, another aspect of your research. Uh, I, I saw in the past when we were allowed to go to uh, conferences and workshops, some very nice uh, 
um, a presentation from from your group about uh, real time slash immersive slash uh, interactive uh, computer simulations. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the so I guess the um, first of all, part of the origin for that is that I'm oh, I kind of always been interested in computer games, um, animation, visualization. That probably that's been a big part of my interest in CFD. You know, compute, creating the nice uh, visualizations. So, you know, I really enjoy that. And so couldn't couldn't pass up the opportunity to 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 find a science excuse to invest in a VR. Uh, kit right and um, the when I started working with Lattice Boltzmann one of the things that struck me like I said is it's not just it's suitability for GPU but it's it's the, the the potential for visualizing the results on the fly right it, as soon as you start using a GPU solver you can access the OpenGL libraries and and, and ways to um, um, display uh, uh, parts of your solution without writing them to the to the disk, um, it, and so you can you can very quickly uh, visualize your, your your flow. And at the beginning, we were using it just as a debugging tool, right? So you would you would you know make a change to a boundary condition or the immersed boundary method that you were looking at, or some kind of an F FSI method, and you would run it, and you would see it would crash, but you'd see in real time where it was crashing. You know, it'd be mm -hmm. crashing from that corner of the domain, or it'd be crashing when when the flow gets too 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 high, accelerates too much in a certain region, and that's a really intuitive way to to understand, um, you know, to develop a code. If you can if you can debug in real time, you know, you save a lot of time. You develop a lot of intuition. So that was the kind of first realization, and then a second realization was that actually you can change the geometry while the simulation is running. So you can, in, in, in Lattice Boltzmann, that one of the bound conditions that is probably the most powerful, if not the most accurate, is, is a simple bounce back condition, where you just switch any given fluid element to be a, a boundary. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, and it, in one line of code, basically, it, you can change its behavior from being a fluid to, to a wall. And on the one hand, this is very powerful because it allows you to import arbitrarily complex geometries instantly. And um, you know any kind of a CAD that you can imagine, you can import that, and that's instantly kind of, in some way, let's say less accurately, much less accurately than if it was in a finite volume body fitted mesh, but still you get some kind of a fast representation of, of the flow around it. So we we realised pretty quick that there would probably be a, a an, an interest, whether it was for education, intuition, or from you know first order industrial understanding to be able to to have this as a, a tool in, in the whole kind of ecosystem of, of, of simulation so we explored this and eventually we, there was a there was some work that was funded by the automotive industry where they they kind of historically and uh, spend a lot of time on on um, clay models of their cars and they, they develop the aesthetics of their cars they um, spend a lot of time making them look nice then they um scan them using you know uh, very high resolution lasers and then they do high resolution simulations on them but that whole process between making finishing the clay mm -hmm. and getting the aerodynamic performance factors <clears throat> will be a month you know can, can take you weeks so the idea was that we would develop a like a computer game environment so we we developed the unreal engine uh we made a virtual wind tunnel and we um instead of you know in the virtual in, in the Unreal Engine, uh, you have physics libraries that you can you, you can you can select. You can have a very basic physics library, or you can have increasingly complex physics libraries. And as as you will see in the you know all the kind of the annual Nvidia uh, releases and, and and latest developments in, in in physics game physics, they're getting increasingly realistic. So what we did basically was swap in a, a, a lattice Boltzmann solver, you know, a full lattice Boltzmann solver for for, for the game physics. Uh, which you know obviously slows things down a bit versus the uh, kind of game animation optimized physics engines, but still is still quite quick. And uh, leverage all of the kind of interactive capability of the of the, of the of the Unreal Engine, so you can you know instantly import a CAD, move it around, um, see how the flow passes and interacts with your CAD object in this virtual domain, 
introduce uh, visualization elements very easily because it's all part of the, um, the game physics engine. And um, yeah, it gives you a kind of a first order way to explore how, how the flow is going. And I think the best way to kind of think about that is, you know, on the, on the one hand, it's probably better than a pen and paper, but also it's, it, it raises a, an interesting question about complexity versus accuracy, right? I think, and this is maybe uh, a point worth thinking about in more, in more detail. There's, there's a tendency in, in modeling and simulation turbulence in particular to focus on a, on a, simplifi on a simplified geometry mm. and really in a lot of detail focus on how the flow goes past this very, very simplified shape, whether it's the armored body of a representation of a car or whether it's, you know, a, you know, a, a, a boundary layer representation of a wing without all the, the, the rivets and, and 3D geometry, geometrical features, or, you know, or, or the kind of classical tandem cylinder case of, of a landing gear. And I think what real time or interactive simulation offers you is a way to see where the complexity lies, the geometric complexity lies, and what are the most important geometric features? For instance, you know, if you know that there's a certain part of the flow that's going to be significantly influencing a, another part downstream, it doesn't really matter exactly the, the level of accuracy around the downstream part because mm -hmm. you know it's going to be it's going to be significantly influenced by what's going on upstream. So that's it allows you to kind of take a different perspective, you know, in terms of the level of detail that you're, you're introducing into the, into the solution. That's fascinating. Very good. Um, I, I have another question is um, if, 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 if tomorrow you, you have access to a, an exascale uh, uh, computer, which, which might happen in, in a few years time, wh what, what will you do with it in terms of um, um, flow configuration or in terms of complexity or yeah, that's, that's that's funny. I mean, it's always the the old adage that you give a you you give us CFD guys um, a computer, we'll fill it, right? You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big it is, how fast it is, how, you know, how many CPUs, how big is how many terabytes. Probably within a few weeks, we'll, we'll, we'll have it completely full. Um, whatever it is, there's always going to be a higher resolution study, mm -hmm. um, uh, more data, more parameters to investigate. But I think I think we probably have to consider that in the context of, of some of the more you know some of the other kind of recent developments and I think I would be again looking to do to explore so we talked about this before um, instead of single parameter point studies looking more at multi multiple parameter points I think there's a tendency to over emphasize a single parameter point uh, study you know one flow condition around one particular geometry I think it's much more um, relevant to the practical engineering to consider a range of parameters and you know like uncertainty quantification but you know maybe not even as 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 as, as kind of um, specific as that just saying okay well is it doing a, launching jobs which automatically explore a range of end parameters um, to an acceptable degree of accuracy um, uh, would, would be something I would look to, to do I, I would also I mean, I, I, I think I would start to look to introduce some of the work I've been doing on, on flow structure interaction. So uh, I mentioned the, about the uh, bio-inspired flows for, for a while. We, we, had a, we had a project looking at um, the, the, um, the performance characteristics of fur and feathers. And I think um, there's definitely a lot to learn from nature, whether mm -hmm. it's fur and feathers or whether it's vegetation. And I think you know almost just from a kind of a curiosity point of view a fluid dynamics point of view there's so much that goes on in the passive interaction of, of a turbulent flow and you know passively um uh, flexible structures but uh, you know I, i'm certain that we can learn something from it so i'd, I'd probably look, be looking to to set up um you know, turbulent flow around um you know bluff bodies with with very large numbers of um of passively adapting devices, whether they're flaps, hairs, feathers, mm -hmm. vegetation, that, that would be definitely something of interest. Great. Uh, so, some sort of follow-up question on that. So, would you say that your research group and more in general, uh, uh, 
the school at Manchester. Would you say that you are ready for the transition to Exascale? And uh, more broadly, will you say that the UK community, uh, the UK turbulence community is ready or you think we, we need to really uh, push for more software development? Interesting. Um, huh. we're, we're, I think we're probably not in a bad, in, in, in an awful position. I think we probably could be in a better position. Um, I think um, increasingly, over recent years, there's been a push to have, um, you know, data repositories and, you know, more focus on on the kind of integrity of data uh, uh, and, and and kind of cater, starting to cater for the sizes of data that are likely to be generated at Exascale. Mm -hmm. I think there's still questions to be asked about bandwidth, uh, trans, you know, throwing large amounts of data um, around. There's still, you know, for a long time, it's still going to be by post rather than by internet, which, you know, is, is kind of weird. But I think um, in terms of the, uh, you know, the latest developments and the, the kind of projected developments and growth of the national facilities, um, you know, they're not bad. They're, they're not world leading. I don't think they're, they're not going to be on, on competitive scale as, you know, US or Japan. And unless something significant is, uh, you know, significant changes to the, to the policy are made, but um, we could, it's still going to be good enough for us to test out some of our ideas and methods. And then hopefully, you know, um, They'll, they'll get picked up and used on the, on the, on the fastest simulations in the world that, you know, including in, in China, the Tianhe 3 is on, on the verge, right, of, of being ready. And will you say that your, your um, let's talk about the Lattice Boltzmann uh, solvers that you have, will you say that they are potentially ready to be used at a uh, very large scale, like uh, uh, thousands of, of, of GPUs, or there is still a, a bit of work on that? So it's one of those things that I would, I always say that um, the evidence points to it being ready, but until you've, and, and there was the groups, the limited groups, because it is very, very limited, um, the tests that have been made demonstrate that it's, it scales extremely well. The, the, you can't ever substitute that for, for practical testing. And most of the tests that are done, as you know, benchmarking, uh, uh, com computational performance are on very simple cases. Yes. So you, you really don't, and, and the whole point of doing something like Lattice Boltzmann is to leverage complex cases. So you don't know until you do it exactly where the bottlenecks are going to be. And there's going to be significant bottlenecks in, in IO. That's why kind of on, like on the fly visualization is going to be very important on the, on the fly data processing, you know, I think there's always going to be a need to, to do data reduction um, for these types of applications. But I think in general case, you know, the evidence points to the codes, you know, the like Lattice Boltzmann, like um, some of the finite difference schemes or spectral element methods that are optimized with GPU in mind, you know, being ready now for, for multiple GPU, um, very large numbers of GPU calculation. Good. I have, I have one, uh, maybe not controversial, but uh, I mean, there's a lot of advantages of using Lattice Boltzmann method from um, what you are telling us. And I've heard about that as well, but um, is there anything wrong with those methods? Oh well, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, of course, that's that's the whole ethos behind um, what, what I've introduced before that, you know, horses for courses, you don't try and use a method for what it's what it's not intended for. and and, and Lattice Boltzmann is on a uniform Cartesian mesh in its vanilla form and its most efficient, powerful mm -hmm. form. It, it's kind of madness to try to extend that to, to, to very detailed, uh, war modeled flow, like transitional flows, because uh, that the resolution requirements are, will become extremely high. Um, the, so limitations are for Lattice Boltzmann will be certainly in, um, in, in detailed wall resolution. Uh, other limitations in their vanilla form, the standard forms of Lattice Boltzmann, there are, there are kind of limitations in the, uh, the use in very uh, in thermal flows with high thermal gradients. 
although they're kind of being overcome similar for for supersonic flows as well mm -hmm. so i don't think that um that it will that despite its strengths force in some cases that it'll become a, a, a the only code that's used by a long stretch great and the method. thank you i i have one final question i'm conscious of time is um where do you see high performance computing um headed in the future do you think that i mean we're talking about a lot of um accelerator technologies gpus and you have been trying to harness those um, hardware but where do you think we are going? Are we going this um, GPU direction or you think we are going to see new concept, new ideas? So one thing we haven't talked about, talked about much, which I'm kind of starting to get into is machine learning and the use of um, big data. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, that's both a huge opportunity and a risk because um, well, obviously it's a huge opportunity because it, you know, it automates and acts, uh, automates what we've been doing manually for a long time, but it, and, and it's also has potential to access huge databases of, of, you know, accurate databases of a range of different flows. But in terms of risk, it, it potentially encourages um, the user to, to be less familiar with the underlying physics and um, the, you know, obviously, I'm kind of coming from a RANS background. Um, I, I I can definitely see the advantages of of having that kind of uh, of of, um, of of ability to be able to understand the, the kind of physical processes in a, in, in in a way that's that that, that drives the, the the terms in a RANS model. And I think that there's a risk that if we leave more and more of these um, the new developments to to big data and to kind of statistical methods that 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 that's somehow lost eventually. You know, there's the, you know people start to to overlook some of the some of the opportunities. I think there's always going to be a need for marrying physical modeling with um, these these approaches. That it's only going to go so far. These these um the you know the, the statistical methods. We can. I think it's very exciting. I think we can. We can leverage them to to kind of herald a you know a new generation of models definitely because they're they're giving us potential not just in terms of the range of the flows that we're going to look at but also the um, being able to to introduce completely new ideas you know one very interesting thing in turbulence is you know aside from the the idea of, of a synthetic representation of the field is 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 the, in, the introduction of non-local modeling you know using some kind of um uh, statistical approach so i think that's going to be big and i think the the way in which we integrate all of our methods together so different fidelity methods so mm -hmm. low fidelity with a med medium fidelity with a high fidelity with real world data all of that being kind of mixed together is a huge opportunity and an exciting thing i think HPC will evolve from being this a terminal to being all around us. It'll be in a in 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 the cloud, and it'll just be it'll just be accessed. And I think um, in that way, it will become increasingly important to to use different fidelity methods with real world data and data simulation type way. Um, so yeah, it's there's there's a lot of exciting trends I think on the horizon with HPC in the broader context. Wow, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, that's it uh, from, from my side. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time and your input. It was very uh, enjoyable to talk to you and uh, we wish you all the best for all your uh, future uh, endeavors. I can see you are very busy uh, investigating uh, lots, of, uh, lots of very interesting uh, things for the turbulence, uh, for the turbulence problem. Uh, that's it for us. Uh, this episode will be made available as usual on the UK Turbulence Consortium website, on YouTube and on uh, SoundCloud. All the links will be shared uh, on the website and on uh, Twitter. Thank you, uh, yeah, Alistair. Thank you. That was very was nice pleasure. talking to you. And for everyone uh, listening to this podcast, I hope to uh, see you soon in a new episode.